God right in this space, Lord. says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Falling on my knees in worship, giving all I am to seek your faith. Lord, all I am is yours. My I call 
rescue and I want to be where you receive everything we need to receive God help us to listen with open ears and open hearts use our pastor in Jesus name hello my name is Ken Corber one of the pastors at Emmanuel Church and we warmly welcome you to worship uh, with us today I'd like to just uh, begin just sharing this um, Hollywood had a scene happen that actually is talked around the whole world right now uh, Chris Rock seems like a nice fellow but uh, he shared something about Will Smith's mo uh, wife. Really upset Will Smith. He seems like a nice fellow. I guess he's quite a talented actor. He came on stage and he slapped Chris Rock. And uh, it's the talk uh, all over the planet. Um, and, and here's a question that I have. Uh, am I, how am I like him? How am I like him? And over Lent, I made a commitment that I wasn't gonna speak evil of people, but twice over Lent, I've caught myself with, why in the world did I say that? So maybe I'm a bit like Chris Rock. And uh, Will Smith uh, slapping Chris Rock. He probably wishes he hadn't done that now, right? I'm sure, I know he does. Um, I played basketball. I retaliated against people. I don't know if I'm any better. 
And then Will Smith um, was offended for his wife, and now there's video showing him making fun of a person uh, who also has, I think it's apoplasia, the, the losing of hair. But I'm not sure I'm better than Will Smith there either. Um, I taught my daughter Carrie how to drive, and as we were driving, that, that's being hypocritical. And as we were driving, uh, Carrie uh, was 16, and she went through a yellow light. I go, Carrie, you can't do that. She goes, well, you do, Dad. So I just wonder when things go on stage and people don't look so good, I wonder how we're like them. Uh, Romans tab, chapter 2 says, uh, be very careful about judging. Because as you judge, look in the mirror. How are you like what you're judging? So here's, here's my question for us today. We're going through the book of Genesis. Um, where's the primary problem that I need to deal with in my life? Is the problem out there, or is my probably primary problem something that's in here? And is there an answer to my sin problem out there? And could there be an answer in here? So here's the outline. Is there a sin problem out there? Is there a sin problem in America? Or the other half of America that's not voting like you? Is there a problem there, but not, not here? Is there a savior out there? And could there be a savior in here? Here's the scripture reading today. It's the story of Judah and then the story of Judah and Tamar uh, with a focus on Tamar. But uh, here's this original story um, from Genesis. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams, or speaking of Joseph. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father Jacob. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, his richly ornamented robe that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, Hey, what, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not lay a hand on him. And after all, he is our brother. He's our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came uh, by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern. They sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and he said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe. They slaughtered a goat, dipped it, the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to the father and said to father, we found this, examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. When then Jacob tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, and he mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, In mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. That was really bad news. Um, I'd like to just start, and I'll come back to that scripture in just a moment. I want to ask again, is there a sin problem out there? Is there a sin problem in America? Is there a sin problem right here? I, I, I read a fascinating book this past weekend. It's called We, the Fallen People. You know how in our original documents as a country. We speak of we the people, we the people. And this person, um, Robert Tracy McKenzie, wrote a book called We the Fallen People. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the gist of his argument. His argument is that when the framers put together the Constitution, this is after the Declaration of Independence, it's now 11 years later, and they're putting together um, the documents that will guide us as a nation. He said that they had a clear sense that Americans' people were fallen, like they needed to develop a government system that would protect America's freedom from the fallenness of our own people. That was in 1787. 
40 years later, there's a president named Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson, it's called Jackson Democracy. I mean, it's like when we're, I'm talking democracy, not against Democrats, Republicans, just the word democracy. And 40 years later, there no longer was a belief in the fallenness of American people. There now was a belief in the virtue of American people. And he said that was a problem. I'd just like to share some, I, I want to get at this issue that there's this concept of sin that our founders actually knew that we have seem to have walked away from. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower in 1952 quoted, he supposedly, he tried to quote de Tocqueville. And he said, de Tocqueville said, America is great because America is good. Except de Tocqueville didn't say that. But I can name to you seven Republican presidents and candidates and governors and senators and seven Democratic Republicans and candidates and presidents who've all said, America's great because America's good. But de Tocqueville actually didn't say that. What he did say is he said Americans uh, live in a perpetual state of self-adoration. It was a 900-page document. He went on to say he agreed with the, the, the framers of the Constitution that there was a fallenness in our country like there is everywhere. Um, the book that I read, just speaking of de Tocqueville, but going beyond it, and just like an understanding of the, the framers of our Constitution, they wrote a, a, they need a government that is made for a largely self-interested group of citizens who are deficient in virtue. I'm not right now picking on America. I'm trying to make a statement about all human beings and Americans happen to be a part of it. And our framers seem to think there was a real problem. But somehow we switch from saying there's a fallenness we must protect ourselves from to we are automatically virtuous because we're American or we might belong to a certain party. The framers in 1787 were responding to a crisis in virtue. Like they recognize our country's not gonna make it unless we figure some things out. Um, and so here's what we did. We created a system of government. They created a system of government where you had the House and the Senate making up laws but counterbalancing each other. The executive branch that could veto things that the laws were made by the people. A Supreme Court that could turn and say, no, you're out of line altogether. The whole system was built to protect us from ourselves. And de Tocqueville went on to say that there was a brilliance in this because the system was built to protect us from the mob and the mob being us. Closing comment, I could go on about this guy's book, but here's one of his arguments. If you ask, well they have, they've asked the average American, are, are we basically good or are we uh, basically bad, fallen? Well, Americans highly have it that we're good, except for the other political party. But Christians in America, who call themselves Christians, 72% would say, yeah, we're intrinsically good. That's actually not biblical. We are intrinsically valuable. We are intrinsically loved, and we're intrinsically image of God bearers, and we are radically fallen. That's Christian, to understand both those things at the same time. But we've left that. And in Jackson's time in the 1820s, he was, they were bragging about how virtuous he was, and he was bragging about how virtuous the American people were, and they could clearly see how wonderful he was to elect him. He also owned, I think it was 100 or 1,000 slaves. He's the person that had the Cherokee Indians get, kind of get wiped out of their position that they were. And they, the guy who wrote the book said he read over 1,000 documents written by Andrew Jackson, and he never saw a sin in himself. So we, we made this radical shift and we still are living in it today. And so I would turn and say, I agree with the Bible. Adam and Eve, fallen. Cain and Abel, fallen. Lamech, fallen. Noah's day, radically fallen. Noah's sons, fallen. Tower of Babel, fallen. Abraham, fallen. Isaac, fallen. Jacob, holy cow, radically fallen, yet his name will become Israel and God will work for good, and he has a son named Judah, and there's gonna be a story of a woman named Tamar, and I'd like to talk you and walk you through that. So Judah, we kind of start reading about him more in the Joseph story. So Abraham, uh, Jacob, who becomes Israel, has 12 sons. The 11th son, his favorite son, is Joseph. The other brothers hate Joseph because 
Their dad loves him most. He's treated favorably. Joseph brings a bad report about his brothers. Joseph has the coat of many colors. He's just beloved. And he has dreams that the others are going to bow down to him and uh, he's going to be ruling. So he's not loved by the brothers. One day as they're out in the field uh, taking care of sheep, dad sends them out to check on the, the sheep out there. He travels a long distance. They see their brother when they see him. They turn and they just say, uh, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. This is not a real healthy family, but it's the family that we come from in the Bible. And let's kill him. And they, they grab him, they're thinking about killing him, and a guy named Reuben, one of the old bro older brothers, says, no, let's don't kill him, let's just throw him in this cistern here, in this well, this empty well. They throw him in there. Now they're eating a nice meal. While they're eating the nice meal, Reuben's off to the side somewhere. Judah turns and goes, let, let, let's not kill him. Let's, let, let's not kill him, and he's in the well. I see the Ishmaelites are going by. What will we gain if we kill him? Let's sell him. So that's Judah. We're not going to kill our brother. Let's sell our brother. And then they took his robe, and they covered it in blood, and they brought it back to dad and say, hey, dad, uh, uh, what do you think this means? Dad sees his son's robe. It's full of blood. And dad's breaking down. My, it's not saying it, but my favorite son has died. And I might as well go down to the grave. And he refused to be comforted. And the brothers tried to comfort him. I and mean, they were so kind in trying to comfort their dad in the lie they made about the brother that isn't dead, but they pretend it was dead, and they threw him into slavery. The story gets worse. So now, a little bit later on, Joseph's in jail, and Judah, uh, he's got a wife that he marries. She's Canaanite. You're not supposed to marry the Canaanite women and tie into their culture, but Judah does. And then he has sons through the Canaanite woman, and one's name is Ur, and one's name is Onan, and the next one is uh, Shela. Shela. And uh, he finds a wife for Ur, and her name is Tamar. And as Ur is with Tamar, he is so wicked, uh, the Lord takes his life. And then you need to have the second son step in because otherwise she's a widow and she's going to be bankrupt. So the, the law back then is, hey, you're, you're, you're the brother. Another son should step in, help her have children so she can have her own family be provided for. So Onan is given, the second son of Judah, is given to Tamar to be her husband, to help her have a family. And he has relations with her without going into detail, but he does things in such a way that there's not going to be children. And... Um, and this is evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, he no longer is living. Now there's a third son, and he's not yet up to puberty. And dad uh, says to his daughter-in-law, uh, go back to your own father. You don't say that. She's supposed to stay with you and your people. Go back to your father. And when my son's old enough, uh, he'll be with you. Except he never does that. He never gives his son to her. And one day Judah's wife dies, and he's mourning. And then he's going to go on a trip to Timnah. And as he's on the trip to Timnah, the word gets to his widowed daughter-in-law, hey, your father-in-law, who didn't give you the third son, he's going to Timnah. So she took off her widow clothes. She dressed herself. She veiled herself, but dressed as a prostitute. And she went where her father-in-law was going. The father-in-law saw, saw her. He said, uh, come sleep with me. She said, what will you give me? And he said, uh, I'll give you a lamb. I'll give you a, a goat. Uh, but I don't have it with me. Well, what's your pledge? Well, I'll give you my staff, and I'll give you uh, my seal, and I'll give you my cord. These are valuable things. He's kind of like some of the other people in the Bible, giving away important things because his flesh is driving them. He has union with her. She has those three things, the staff and the seal and the cord. Uh, he leaves comes back later on to get his staff seal and cord with his goat, except the girl's not there. Where, where, where's the prostitute? What prostitute are you talking about? There's no prostitute here. Huh. And he goes, well, we just let's get out of here. We don't want to be a laughing stock. I guess she gets to keep my valuable things. Judah finds out that his daughter-in-law, who's widowed, she's pregnant. And Judah righteously rises up and says, let's burn her. Um, obviously, that's not righteous, but that's his attitude. And it's not just stone her, not just, let's burn her to death. And so she's brought out, and as she's brought out, she says, uh, do you recognize this? And do you recognize the seal and the court? Who, who, who owns these? And he turns and says, you're more righteous than I am. And I was supposed to give you my son, and I didn't. I'm just going to leave you in poverty, because that's how we do things. That's not how we're supposed to, but that's how we do it. It's just, it's just broken. She's pregnant. She has twins. One twin comes out, his arm comes out, and they put a red cord around him. His arm goes back in, 
and Perez comes out. And as Perez comes out, it means like he, he breaks out. Um, he's now going to be uh, the one that the blessing of God is going to come through. So we, I've just told you a horrible story. I started my sermon saying, we got sin on TV, and I got sin in me. And I'm asking if you have sin in you. And then we looked at the American framers, and they said, there's a, there's a problem here. We need to develop a government to protect us from ourselves. But many in America don't think we need protection. We just need protection from the other side, but not from me. And now I'm telling you a story from the Bible, and once again I'm telling you a story from the Bible and the people of Israel. And Judah looks really bad, and, and Tamar is not good, and, and there's a, a kid born, and everything's a mess. And God yet is going to work for good, because when I read Ruth's message in the Bible, we hear of someone coming from Perez, who's going to lead to Boaz, who's going to marry Ruth the Moabitess, and work its way down to King David, which eventually works its way to Jesus. And there's this line of Jesus that he's going to work for good in the midst of this broken people. And when you read Jesus' genealogy, Tamar's name is listed. Bathsheba's name is listed. Ruth's name is listed. Solomon's wife, the wife of Uriah, her name is listed, and God says, there's a huge sin problem. And the Messiah is going to come from a line of the brokenness of humans and straight from the Lord and be born of a virgin to save those broken humans. There's all kinds of stories in the Bible of God redeeming broken lives like Tamar. Uh, the woman at the well who has had five husbands and now is with a sixth man. Uh, Jesus drinks water with her tells him of himself, and eventually says, you've had five husbands, you're living with a sixth man. But by the time he's done with her, she's the evangelist saving, God uses her to save a Samaritan city underneath Jesus, leading the way, obviously. In John 8, there's a woman caught in adultery. And Jesus, when he's done with a woman caught in adultery, he says, where are your accusers? When he defends her. My accusers are gone, they aren't here to stone me. He goes, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Jesus is the savior of, of people. I'll get to men in a minute. Here's one more woman story. Mary Magdalene, she has seven demons in her. Jesus kicks the demons out and restores her, and she becomes a part of God's story of grace. All these stories I'm telling you are stories of brokenness that the Lord turns and says, I'm going to make you part of my story. Peter is a denier. He becomes a leader in God's story. Paul is a murderer. He becomes a leader in God's story. Uh, Thomas is a doubter. He gets used in God's story. This is the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like to just share a couple stories with you just about how God changes sinners and uses sinners. One of the guys in my Thursday night world uh, shared this story with me. He shared that his wife was raised by an auntie um, in Latin culture and, uh, called Tia, and Tia Maria. And he just said that Tia Maria uh, didn't know the Lord, came to know the Lord, and adopted his wife and four other siblings. And those siblings now and his wife are these radiant people in Christ, but it came from God breaking into uh, an older woman's life, impacting her and her turning and grabbing children and raising them in the Lord Jesus that they could be radically different. And this lady shines in our church. Her husband, I'll call him F, F just shared that before he knew the Lord, he was lost in sin and he hated his father because his father abandoned him, treated him poorly, hurt him. So it felt like he didn't even have a dad. And then he said that he became a Christian and his pastor said, you need to forgive your dad because I don't even have a dad. No, you need to forgive him. And your attitude needs to change toward authority. You have rebellion inside of you. And so he told him, you need to say out loud because of God's forgiveness of you, I forgive you, dad and God forgive me of my grudges. And so our brother said this over and over again for many years, and finally he saw his dad who had wronged him, had sinned against him, like Will Smith and Chris Rock sinning each other and slapping each other. Well, go way beyond that. His dad had wronged him, but he had now, now he's a Christian. And God had forgiven him. And when he saw his dad, many years later, they ran to each other, they embraced each other, gave each other kisses on the cheek, and there became a relationship. And God is the healer 
that restores broken Will Smiths, broken Chris Rocks, broken Judas and Tamars, broken Ken Corvers. So is there a sin problem? Yeah, it's in all of us. And is there a Savior? Yes, there's a great Savior. And he saves people all through the Bible and people that you and I know. And then the question is, could there be a Savior who lives inside of me? Could I have a Savior live inside of me because my sin problem is great? So in Romans chapter 8, Paul, who got changed radically by Jesus, he said, when I do what I want to do, I sin. I do what I, I, do what I don't want to do and what I want to do, I don't do. Who can, help the, who can save this wretched man? Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. And in Romans 8, he says there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Then he also turns and says, the Spirit's going to live inside people, and so not only will they be forgiven because of Christ, but they're going to be changed from being radical sinners through Christ, because Christ in us. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. He sent his Son as a sin offering for us. But now the righteous requirements of the law can be met through those who have the Spirit inside of them. If, the, if you're controlled by the Spirit, you're no longer completely dominated by the flesh way. Here's the exact words. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but you're controlled by the Spirit. The Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in you to give life to your mortal bodies so that you can now kill sin. Here's where I'm going with all this. There's a huge sin problem in the world. My biggest sin problem is me. There's a Savior who forgives people like Ken Corver who repent and believe. There's also a Savior who by His Holy Spirit and dwells us that we can become like Christ all by God's power and by leaning on Him moment by moment. So is there a sin problem? Well, American Christians would say, well, not necessarily in me because I'm intrinsically good. But the Bible would turn and say, no, there's a huge sin problem. Even our American framers of our Constitution recognize there's a giant problem. And Christians don't fight that anymore. We turn and say, amen. I need to be forgiven. I need the healing of the Lord, the deliverance of the Lord. I need it. Let me tell you, tell you how there's brokenness in my family and the Lord's healing and then tell you a, a, a story of God's redeeming work. I went to Disneyland uh, recently with my wife, our five children now, and our four grandkids. We went to the happiest place on earth, right? We had a great day at the happiest place on earth. We couldn't have loved our grandkids more. We just blessed them, loved them. We had, it was so fun. And now we're leaving. We're on the tram, and you have to drive to the parking lot. And in fact, we're not quite on the tram. We're pushing the, the carts of our kids, grandkids, to get on the tram. And there's four grandkids. I won't name the name of one of the grandkids that I just love so much. And all of a sudden, that grandkid, who just had the most glorious day, just turned and just whacked another grandkid in the face with a mighty smack. I, I, I saw it happen. And immediately, the, the other you know, grandchild is crying and can't figure it out. And you're like, where did that come from? They must have bad parents. They must have bad grandparents. That, what's wrong with that kid? Well, kids from my family. It seems to run in the system. But there's a savior of my grandkids and of my kids and myself who can redeem us, who can restore us, and he does. So here's my Sunday night group this past week, and I was so encouraged. This one guy came to our church four years ago. The main problem of the world was out there. He's turning and he's now saying, I'm finally learning the importance of repentance. I have to repent a lot. It's now a major part of my life. And he's saying that smiling. Yeah, there's a sin problem. And God's redeeming, you see. And you're becoming delightful. And another bro brother spoke up and he goes, man, my whole life I was in bondage to myself. Everything was always about me, but God's given me a new way of thinking. And in the Holy Spirit and in the Word and in fellowship, I'm being changed, and his face is changing, his heart is changing. What a great savior for great sinners. And finally, R. I met with R for coffee the other week, and R turned and he just said, God is convicting me that my biggest problems are not my dad, because I used to think my biggest problem was my dad. My biggest problem now is me. And he goes, and I feel like I've been a, a loud gong and a clanging cymbal like 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of, but God is wanting me to be, love is patient, love is kind, it's not envious, it's not boastful, it's not rude. And God's doing that in me, and I see him doing it. And here's his text that came this week to us. The sinful life of Judah. He plots to kill his brother. He's abandoned by, he abandons his daughter-in-law. He sleeps with prostitutes, and God yet uses him. From the broken, for the broken, our Savior came to save Judah. 
our Savior came to save our, the Savior came to save me and to make us like Christ. I want to close and just ask this of you. Do you recognize that there's a huge sin problem in America? And the biggest problem that you need to address is the one inside of you. And when you address that in Jesus, he forgives. And then you walk humbly with the Will Smiths and the Chris Rocks and the politicians and the neighbor and your spouse and your grandkid. You walk humbly with them because he has forgiven you much. And by the Holy Spirit, he's changing you to act like Christ towards sinners as he saves you, a sinner saved by grace. Hallelujah for a great Savior. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you. Your word teaches that we've been made in your image and there's great beauty. Your word also shows us uh, that we're, we've got a huge sin problem, all of us. Thank you for the wisdom in our own country of actually recognizing fallenness. We pray that we might recognize that again in our country, in our world. And I pray that we might recognize how much we struggle with sin on our own and how broken and lost in sin we are on our own. We praise you that when we repent, we are brought into your kingdom and believe. We praise you that we get to repent daily of what's not like Christ, be forgiven. And we praise you by the Spirit, we can become like Christ by total dependency. Have your way with us. We praise you that you're the great Savior of sinners like us. We pray we be humble with others and we be agents of grace in our broken world where we slap each other, we threaten each other with nuclear weapons. Would you heal us, redeem us, restore us? Let us be agents of grace by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. I wonder if you could open your hands. I'd like to bless you because you're going to go in the power of Jesus to go bless the world by his grace and power. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the powerful support of fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as you go bring the shalom of the Lord to a broken world that needs the Savior. God be with you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son,